First of all, I have to tell you that it's such a joy to see so many children. Um, there were two things that happened in my life that God prepared me. Because, you know, as you get older, if you don't have children in your lives, you can be, you know, one of those, uh, you can turn into one of those crabby old men. And uh, the first one was when I first became Orthodox, and I was, uh, I was a simple monk, and I went to a parish in Santa Rosa, California, Holy Protection, OCA Parish. And uh, there was this, there were a lot of little kids, and there was one little kid that particularly irritated me because I felt his parents were a little bit loose with him, and, and uh, he did a few cute things, like, for instance, when this was a parish that for the epiclesis, the calling down on the Holy Spirit and the gifts, everyone would do a, um, a prostration, which I really loved. It was beautiful. So anyway, there was this little boy, and he, you know, kids imitate, and they follow us, and they see what we're doing, and they notice, and we don't think they notice, but they do. And so we've all seen cute little boys and girls that take their mother's uh, pearls and they swing them like a censer. We've, we've all seen that. Well, this little boy would do full prostrations, but he did it in the wrong direction. <laughs> so we would be going like this, and he would be going like this. And so it, it was very cute, but he was very noisy and moved around a lot, and, and he irritated me. I thought, you know, he should be just sort of standing there like this. We had Forgiveness Sunday. How many of you avoid Forgiveness Sunday? <laughs> There's something about the Forgiveness Sunday Vespers that's, that I really believe is the most avoided service in the entire year. I don't really want to stand and tell somebody I forgive them. I don't even want to ask their forgiveness. They haven't, they haven't groveled before me yet. Or we don't even say anything, we just avoid it's sort of like this inner clock. Oh, it's Forgiveness Sunday. Oh, am I busy this afternoon? So it was Forgiveness Sunday, and in this parish, the priest would, would stand there and ask everyone. He would say, please forgive me for any hurt or offense I have caused you in any way, and then he would prostrate. And uh, so he did it according to rank. First the priest, then the deacon, then the readers, and then the monks, etc., and so, uh, and then you continue on. I haven't been able to prostrate without help getting up for years, so I don't do that anymore. I just do a profound bow. But I prostrated, and there was, all of a sudden there's this little boy, the little monster boy. <laughs> and, uh, and I thought, oh, dear. So I said, please forgive me for any hurt or offense I have caused you in any way. And I prostrated. And he didn't have the words down pat, but he said something to that effect back. And he prostrated back. And I was so moved by that moment that I burst into tears. And from that point on, that little monster kid was like a little angel. <laughs> and I took joy in his wanderings about. He was like the chosen people, wandering about. <laughs> it was just, it was so cute. And uh, there was another one that I was going to tell you about. What was that? Um, there was a woman in one parish, that same parish. She was an elderly woman, Russian. And they had these... Uh, this tradition that on Sundays after the liturgy there was a meal, but you had to pay for it. And we were two poor monks, and we didn't have money, and most parishes they, oh, Father, no, 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 you know, you didn't pay. So I just took it for granted that we didn't need to pay for our parochials. And this woman did not approve of that. <laughs> she never told me that she disapproved that we weren't paying for our pierogies. But you could sense it. It was sort of like being slammed into a vacuumed room and have all of the air sucked out. 
That was kind of what it was like when I was in her presence. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out why. And one day I asked the priest. I said, do you happen to know what's going on with her? She treats us like pariahs. And, uh, and he said, uh, do you think it, and I said, do you think it has anything to do with the fact that we don't pay for our pierogies? And he said, oh yes, that's probably the reason. She is the head of the sisterhood, and they make the pierogies as a fundraiser for the church. And you don't have to pay. You're monks, and we don't expect you to pay. But somehow, she expects you to pay. <laughs> So, they were having a special um, dinner, and it was going to be a fundraising dinner, and it was $50 a plate. And I talked to Father Paul, and I said, you know, we, we weren't going to go. I mean, it, was, it would be sort of unmonastic to go to a $50 a, a plate dinner. So we really avoided things like that. Then, I do it now. <laughs> With relish. But then I didn't. I was more pious then. And so, uh, so I said, you know, we need to give her $100 and, we, and just tell her that, gee, we know you're doing a fundraiser, but we can't be there, but here's $100 uh, as our donation. So I went up to her after liturgy, we had planned to stay for the free pierogi. I went up to her and I said, oh, we have to leave, but I, I just wanted to give you this $100. Father Paul and I won't be able to be at your fundraising banquet, but we, want, but we really love what you're doing, uh, you and the sisterhood. It's a, it's a great thing. So we want to give you this money as our contribution, however meager it might be. And it was, it was like I had given her... 12 gold coins. It was like the whole, her demeanor completely changed. We still had our free pierogies on Sundays, but she gave them to us with a smile. And you know, sometimes when we have kinds of differences of opinion or misunderstandings with people, we want to assume what's going on, but we don't really know for sure and so the best response is to do is kindness, love, mercy, and forgiveness. We're not asked to, to, we're not told that we should wait until they've asked our forgiveness. We're not, as, as a monk, it was not her responsibility to be kind to me. But it was my responsibility to be kind to her. And that's the difficult part of being a Christian. Because you've got to go out of your way sometimes and go into your uncomfortable zone and do what you know God is calling you to do. And every one of us is, is giving ample opportunities. And if we're paying attention, they come on an almost daily basis. You know, some people think that Living in a monastic community is just a sort of an idyllic place to live. But one of the things that is, there's, there's two ways in orthodoxy that we have that lead to salvation, that are salvific. One of them is in the married state, and the other one is in the monastic state. Uh, to be uh, an unmarried is more difficult, because as an unmarried, you're really pretty much on your own. You make the decisions. Nobody else... You know, it doesn't have to, you don't have to take other people into account necessarily. But in the monastic life, the monk is obedient, or the nun, is obedient to the rule of the monastery and to the abbot or abbess. The abbot is obedient to the rule and to his brothers. I don't make any major decision affecting the monastery without consulting the tonsured members of the community. Because that's the salvific role for me. That's what will bring me salvation. It's not about my will. One of the big differences between 
Roman Catholic monastic life and the Orthodox monastic life, although Vatican II brought in changes, so there's less differences now. But let's take um, the Benedictines are probably the closest to our tradition in monasticism. And I've always had close relationships with the Benedictines. Uh, the Mount Angel Abbey in Oregon, uh, they've always been very kind to me. And uh, uh, in fact, the last time I was there for, I took a young seminarian from St. Petersburg, Russia with me uh, for a prearranged time when he could have time with, in their seminary uh, at, at the request of his rector because he was going to be teaching seminary at St. Petersburg Theological Academy. So I'm a board member of the Seattle St. Petersburg Sister Churches program, and we sponsor things like that. So we made arrangements, and I arrived, and the abbot of the monastery, big monastery, met me and took me to down this large corridor uh, uh, in the monastic enclosure, and there was this huge oak door, and it said Abbot Trefon on it. And uh, I thought, wow, this, this, I could get used to this. And he opened the door, and here's the archbishop's suite. They were, uh, they were going to have me use the archbishop's suite for the week that I was there. I walked in, my cell phone rang, and it was a Hiramon friend of mine. And I said, Father Mark, you'll never guess. I'm at the Abbey, and they just gave me the archbishop's suite for a week. And when the lights went on, and there was a one wall that lit up, and I opened up a cupboard, and there was a little refrigerator, and I opened up the refrigerator, and there was some... Uh, uh, some uh, Coca-Cola and different things in there, but there was a bottle of um, uh, um, uh, what's this, which you mix with um, tonic water. Yeah, it was tonic water. And I said, oh my gosh, they have tonic water. If I'd known, I would have brought a, a bottle of, um, of gin with me. I could have made a gin and tonic. <laughs> and he says, Father Trefon, it's a Benedictine monastery. Look further. <laughs> So I opened up another cupboard, and there was my favorite gin. <laughs> and since I worked as a bartender bouncer in an Irish pub in graduate school in Berkeley, I made a gin and tonic with one hand. <laughs> and I had a great time with those Benedictines. <laughs> but traditionally, Benedictines, the abbot, like ours, would be ruling for life. He would be elected by his community, and he would rule for life. But they had something uh, that was a part of their tradition that didn't really come from St. Benedict, who's one of our saints as well, but rather it came from um, the Middle Ages, so that the abbots were really ruling their monasteries more like a, a fiefdom, like the lord of a fiefdom. And so because of that, uh, the, 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 the lord abbot, has a nice ring to it. The Lord Abbot, in fact, we got the thing, the Salish Sea, the Salish Brotherhood. Salish is the, is the Puget Sound, is an inner, uh, one of the largest inner seas. And, and so the Puget Sound is part of the Salish Sea, which goes all the way up into Canada. So we call ourselves the Salish Brotherhood of St. John the Wonder Worker, the Knights of the Salish Sea. <laughs> and uh, one of my local Greek Orthodox priest friends, when he first moved to the area, he gave me the title, The Lord Abbot of the Salish Sea and All the Isles. <laughs> I was the one that had all of the isles. So, but, but, but again, going back to this salvific role of monasticism, is, is it is, is required of me that I put to rest my ego and my self-will. And that's not easy. So if I was just a bachelor uh, and I had no one else to account to, it would be harder for me to, to achieve that. Now, one of the things, the difference is, and I want, I'm going to stand up for this one because I want you gentlemen here to really hear me. And you ladies can sit back and enjoy every moment of what I'm going to say. <laughs> Whenever I have a couple that are journeying into orthodoxy and they're a married couple and they, 
they decide they want to be orthodox. I always tell them that, well, we're going to have a series of meetings that, that you could actually say is like a, a pre-marriage counseling session. Even though you're married, you need to know that there's a difference in the way we approach marriage in the Orthodox Church. And this is the salvific difference. In Protestantism and in Roman Catholicism, there is this tradition that when you, uh, that you, when you exchange vows, you exchange the ring, and you're vowing to one another. And so over the years, both as a police chaplain who is looking for uh, signs uh, of abuse in a relationship, uh, you know, women oftentimes think that part of, the, um, of their obedience or their uh, commitment in marriage uh, when they've exchanged vows is no matter what. In fact, I have to tell you, and I'm going to say this and it will be recorded and, and I don't care who hears this, but I heard recently from a group of priests on the, west, on the East Coast that some monastic gave a retreat in which he told women that it was salvific for them to take the abuse. That they should take the abuse. <laughs> Say what? <laughs> I mean, I had this image when I heard of it, this priest that was telling me about it. I, I, I had this image. It was, it was a fantasy that formed in my mind of a bunch of women rolling up their sleeves <laughs> and taking him on. That was absolute rubbish to think that. Why would a man have a right to abuse his wife? And why would a woman in, in her marriage commitment have to take it? Why? It's not, it's not true. The Lord does not require that of you if you're abused. This goes for men who are abused, because that happens too. Men and women, no one, a child, no one deserves to be abused. And there's nothing salvific about it. Think about it. The man who's beating on his wife, and she's taking it, because she thinks, well, I have to submit to my husband, and somehow God wills this. Well, what is this doing to him? He's not being repentant because no one's calling him on it. So it's two people's souls being ruined, his and hers both. That's not our Christian faith. What happens that is different in the Orthodox Church is we don't have the exchange of vows. What happens instead is we have the crowning, which is the sacramental moment of a marriage. Now, when the Archbishop of Canterbury was marrying uh, Princess Diana and uh, Prince Philip, Charles, excuse me, I remember I sat up watching that all night. Every, the whole world did. It was beautiful. At least we romantics sat up and watched it. <laughs> I cried. <laughs> it was so tender. <laughs> but one of the things that the Archbishop of Canterbury said to the bride and groom standing before him was that, uh, that in the, he referred to the Orthodox ceremony of the crowning. And he referred to the crowning in Orthodoxy as like everyone for that moment is a prince and a princess. No. The crowning is not about being a prince and a princess, however cute you might be. It's the crown of martyrdom. Death to self. So, gentlemen, think about the moment the crown was set on your head. Did you feel like a puffed up Prince? Or were, you, or were you thinking about what that means? 
It means that you have to, for the rest of your married life, be obedient to your spouse. And she, in turn, has to be obedient to you. It's this balance. And sometimes part of the balance that's required of us as we, as we go deeper into the spiritual life is not to be paying attention to whether, well, let's see, I did my part, did you do your part? It's not like a scale in a grocery store. Oh, like, well, well I, I've done my part, where are you? I'm not going to do any more until you do your part so it's like this. And in fact, since you haven't done your part for some time, it has to be like this. That's not what it's about. It's about you and what you're doing. Don't worry about them. Worry about what you're doing. And make sure that if, you're, if your marriage is in trouble because it's become either abusive or distant, and, and you men are going to be, some of you may be a little perturbed with me what I'm going to say here next. You women will be loving this. You'll want to give me medals. I'll take them. In a day and age when most women have to work to support the family, so that there's two people working, you men need to take up the house chores equally, which means washing dishes, scrubbing floors, vacuuming, changing babies, cooking, mowing the lawn is not just a man's job. I remember, remember I told you earlier about kids pay attention to things? When I was in the fifth grade, my dad went off to the golf course and my mother said, I thought you were going to mow the lawn before you went golfing today. I'll do it tonight. Well, tonight came, and he was late getting back from the golf course. And so my mother was out as the sun was going down, mowing the lawn. Not because it really needed it, because, but that was her way of saying to my dad, you fell down on the job. Because as he came home, he had to suffer seeing his wife mowing the lawn. And it was a push mower. It's about balance. There's no reason why you men can't wash dishes, do the laundry, change the baby's diapers. There's no reason at all for a woman to have to come home after a full day's work and do all of those chores while the man comes home and sits back with the proverbial pipe is wrong. It's not Orthodox Christianity. Sorry, it's not. So, when, and, and, and the ones that seem to have the most trouble with this are evangelicals, serious evangelicals, which is why I always do a debriefing when they become Orthodox, because the men need it. The women are, are even need it, because so many women have, have been so sucked into that image that they don't get the fact that they don't need to take this. It's not equal. Now, I, something else that I wanted to share with you um, about forgiveness. This happened to me, I don't remember, a year ago, somewhere in there. I had been, um, periodically, I'm called either to Pierce County or King County when there's a particular tragedy um, where they need lots of chaplains. And I had been called out uh, for a, the death of a police officer in Portland. And uh, it was um, early in the morning, or late at night, that I went out. And I, so early in the morning, uh, the ferries don't start until around 5 to go back to the island. And so I went into a coffee house in, in, uh, on Capitol Hill in, down in, in Seattle. And I had my, uh, my MacBook Air opened, for you PCers. 
And I was working. And uh, two young men came and sat in a table that was about as close as that rail is right here. And I'm sitting there, and one of them says, only a stupid old man would believe in God. I'm sitting in a corner, and there was no stupid old man behind me. (laughs) I didn't see any stupid old man around me. I could have taken a selfie to check for sure, but I'd seen myself earlier in the evening in a mirror. And I thought, hmm, they must be talking about me. So, I could have done all kinds of things. I could have, how dare you speak to me like that? I could have forgotten my state in life and, and, uh, and slugged him. I could have pulled his chair out from under him. I could have walked out in a huff. I could have put a the evil eye on him. I don't even know how to do that. But there's all kinds of things I could have done. (laughs) But I chose to see this as something that had been put before me as a test, not unlike the angels unawares. So I said nothing. I didn't even look at them. I left my MacBook Air open so the glow of of the Apple would be seen. I li- listen, I live in the capital of the PC people in Seattle, so it's, I, it's my duty. So I, I went out, I went up to the barista, and I said, do you sell gift certificates? And she said, yes. And I said, I would like to buy two gift certificates. And, I, and they're for the young men that are sitting over there. And, but don't give it to them until I've left the premises. So I went back, reverently closed my <laughs> MacBook Air, and I left. About two months later, I'm back in that same cafe. It's called the... the they've been, the ventriloquo, or the, what's the name of that old, some of you older guys? Victrola, it's called the Victrola. And uh, so I'm, I go back in the Victrola, and I'm sitting back, I, as, a, as a police chaplain, I like to have my back to the wall, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> you FBI guys do that too. <laughs> so, so I'm sitting there, and, uh, and I... And I'm working, and all of a sudden, there's two young men standing right here. I looked up, and it was them, two months later. And one of them, the guy that had uttered the words, said, uh, we just want to know, after I said those unkind words about you, why you would give us, why you would buy us gift certificates. And I said, because God told me so. (laughs) And the young man teared up and he said, well, I just want to apologize and ask your forgiveness. And I do what everybody knows I would do. I stood up, hugged him, and said, of course you're forgiven. You were forgiven the moment I heard the words coming out of your mouth. Two things happened at that moment. One was that a multitude of my sins are covered. And this, these young men received a big dose of grace. And it's all about 
making Christianity visible. Not by how we dress, not by the doctrines we teach, not by the amount of icons we have on our dashboard. But why did you have a lot on your dashboard? <laughs> but it's, it's about being up front about our faith, being serious. What people, not just young people, but what people generally need to see in our age of unbelief is authenticity. And the only way that we, we can't, that's, we cannot be authentic as actors. It doesn't work that way. Because if you're thinking, well, I'm going to have to contrive being authentic, it comes across as inauthentic. It has to be something that is such a part of you that you that it comes out of you as like pores. You know, it's it has to be a natural thing. And so if you as a an older person Oh, my, I was going to tell you my second thing, the big thing, that was a lifesaver for me, connected with a little boy in the church. I was, we were in, uh, we, before we moved our monastery to Vashon Island, we, our monastery was in Richmond, California, in a really bad neighborhood. It was the only neighborhood we could afford. All the people around us had bars on their windows. Uh, day and night, uh, cars would go by with boom boxes, kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. And we lived there for about four years. And the final uh, assault on my nerves was one night I heard a helicopter hovering over our house. And I went out and I looked up, and here was a police, co a police helicopter, 45 minutes hovering over the monastery with two huge beam spotlights on a neighbor's front door and back door. And the, car, and the house was surrounded, a corner house, was surrounded by undercover narcotic agents. Big drug bust. And I went back into my cell, and I sat at my desk, and I looked up at the sky, which was orange, because we lived not too far from the Richmond refinery, so it was always orange. I felt like we were living on another planet. And I said, God, I can't take it anymore. You know that scene out of that movie where the guy throws open the windows, and he yells out, I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Well, I was a monk, and I wasn't going to do that. So I left the window closed, and I just said, Lord, I'm really upset. Please get us out of here. And the next day, I called the bishop, and I said, can we have a blessing to look for a rural location? But when we first moved there, and we were really struggling financially, we had no support base whatsoever, and we were new to Orthodoxy. We had been Eastern Catholic monks. And uh, so we had uh, one of my friends, who was a, uh, a Christian brother, the superior of the Christian Brother House in Berkeley. They had the St. Mary's College High School. It's an all-boys high school at the time, and uh, Brother... Uh, Alexis asked me one day, he said, you know, I know you taught college before, would you, uh, and I know you guys are struggling, would you like to come and teach in our school? And I said, well, I taught psychology, do you need a psychology teacher? And he said, no, we need an English teacher and a religion teacher. And I said, well, I can do the religion part, I don't know about the English, but I did, I taught English there for three years. My very first class and on, here I am in my robes and my, my klobuk or my kamalavka uh, and my big beard. And I'm sitting there and I mean, I'm standing there in my class and my, I taught freshman and sophomore in my first class teaching at St. Mary's College High School. Very first day to teach was a, were a bunch of freshmen. Of course, they're already scared to death. Brand new school, 
They're new to it, they're new to high school, and they walk in like deer in the headlights. And the first kid to walk in was a man, a young man by the name of Paris. That was his first name. Handsome young man with a mohawk, a tall, purple mohawk. I don't know what mohawks, about purple. What is this purple thing? I think I would look good. I could take these, use mousse, pull it up to the top, and dye it purple, and boy, would I look. Well, <laughs> so, so this guy walks in, young black man. He, was, he, he had a job as a, um, a model. And so every time he came to the class, he had really w different looking outfits that were expensive looking. And uh, he got to wear, keep the clothes that he would try, or maybe he was just wearing them, I don't know what. But anyway, his name was Paris, and he comes in with his hair like this. And I'm thinking, oh, good grief. And now I'm still in that mode about being the, uh, the crabby old man. And the next guy, immediately that came in after him, was a young man in a black leather jacket with motorcycle boots, black tight jeans, and the black leather jacket had spikes in it. There go those spikes again. <laughs> and he had an Elvis Presley hairdo, a big pompadour that was greased. You could see the shine of the grease. And I'm thinking, oh, no. How am I going to do this? And I kid you not, these two became my favorite students. They were the kindest both of them, at different times during the year, would surprise me with gifts. The, the guy with the, with the pompadour thing made me a backpack for my bike, made it by hand, my bicycle. They were nice, and they were good students. They were kind to other students. They were wonderful. There were a lot of other students that were different too, but they opened my eyes. And, and I've never been the same since then. And I, I see that period of time in my life as a God-given gift that I look at young people and I don't see mohawks or spikes or tattoos. I see family. They're my family. And I love them. The... The other story that I want to tell you, and this happened um, when I was young. I know it's hard to believe now that I was ever evidently, that I was ever a long distance runner, but I was. <laughs> now I can barely go up the steps without losing my breath. But I used to live, in, when I was in Portland, um, one of my favorite, there were two favorite places for me to go running. One of them was the Wildwood Trail in, in Forest Park, which is this 500-acre park. It's a, it's a natural park, uh, and you go into that park, and most of the time you can run for hours and not see anybody. It's, it's that remote and beautiful. It's like a primordial park with, with dripping water everywhere and ferns everywhere, and it's just beautiful. And another place is Multnomah Falls on the Columbia Gorge. And, go, and it's one of the tallest falls in the, in the country. And there's a whole series of falls, if you're on the old highway, that, that are cascading down. But Multnomah Falls is the highest. And it's actually two falls. And there's a bridge that goes over. So if you're on the bridge, you're looking down at falls and up. And there's switchbacks that, goes up, that go up to the very top and go into another primordial forest that is pure and beautiful. And I always would go, at least once a month, I'd go there to run. I'd run up to the top, uh, and then I'd run back in the forest. And, uh, and I always took a little pack on my back with a, with a hoodie and a sandwich and some water. And I would basically, this would be a day run. And so I, as a monk... I really wanted to revisit that place that had been sacred ground to me. So I was in, I was 
on Bashan Island, but I was in Portland to see my spiritual father, and I had some extra time. And so I thought, well, I'm going to revisit that place, so I'm going to hike up there. So uh, I borrowed a friend's little backpack and put it on the back of my cassock and uh, my shoulders, and I went, started up. Uh, and uh, I got up to the very top, and I started off on this trail. And it was a weekday, and there was only one other car parked down there by the lodge when I arrived. And just as I was back in about a half hour into the forest, I came across a young man sitting on a log. He didn't see me. He had his back slightly to me. And I didn't want to startle him, so I, I called out to just to let him know that there's somebody here. And I said, uh, how are you doing? And he turned around. And he, he looked like he had seen a ghost. And, and, and he actually looked frightened for a moment. And uh, so in an attempt to put him at ease, I said, uh, I'm, I'm on an old, I'm on a hike to revisit areas that I used to run, and this is about the area that I would always stop and have some coffee and a sandwich. Can I share my sandwich with you? And in kind of a weak voice, he said, yes. So I sat down with him, and he looked at me, and he said, are you an angel? And I said, why do you ask? And he showed me his revolver. He said, I'm at the end of my life, of my ropes, end of my rope. He says, I can't live any longer. I'm too unhappy. And this is my dad's gun out of his drawer. And I have come up here to kill myself. And then I saw, and he says, and I've been sitting here praying for a sign that God doesn't want me to do this. And then there you are. put my arm around him and I said I'm not an angel but I am God's messenger and I said God wants me to tell you that it's going to get better and then we shared a sandwich and some coffee it was kind of like a hipster communion. <laughs> I had one cup of coffee, so we had to pass it back and forth. And uh, so we talked for quite a while about his life, about why he turned out his girlfriend broke up with him. You know, young men never know that it's that there'll be another woman down the line that's better suited. They always think that this is it. And he was not doing well in school. He was fighting with his parents. He had all these things that had stacked up against him and he felt like there's nothing for me. Nothing. And so he said, he thought, well, I'll just go way up in this forest where no one will hear the shot and I'll kill myself. And uh, so we had a long talk. And I asked him to give me the revolver. And I emptied the bullets. And I threw them into the forest. And 
then we walked down together. And when we got down to, the, to our cars, we were still the only two cars there. So this was a, provid, a divinely providential moment that I was called there for that. In that moment, I was an ag agent of the Lord. Remember I said earlier that if you don't have an angel unaware, be one? Well, that, God had called me to be an angel unaware at that moment for this young man. And so by the time we got back down to our vehicles, it, quite a few hours had passed, maybe two or three hours, and I said, I said, I'm going to pray for you. And I said, when you get home, I don't want you to just slip this revolver back in your dad's drawer. I said, I want you to promise me that you're going to give it to your dad when he gets home and tell him what you had done and what you had planned and the sequence of what had happened. And I said, just know that maybe if you, if you describe me to your dad, he might think you, it was an apparition. <laughs> but again, this is incarnation. This is, this is what it means to be incarnational to others. The, 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 to be God's love and mercy for others. And sometimes it might just simply mean being the one that bothers to make it your business when you hear a woman being beaten by her husband through the wall of your apartment and doing something about it and not deciding it's not your business. I was in Berkeley once driving up uh, uh, Shattuck Avenue and, uh, and I saw this man roughing up a woman on the corner and I uh, I did kind of a Starsky and Hutch thing <laughs> I drove up on the curb with my car <laughs> and I leapt out and I told the guy in my most authoritative voice back off and then I stood between now this is something I would recommend but I stupidly maybe but I stood between him and the woman relying on the fact well in fact I told him I said and he started to come at me and I said two things one I have white hair and I'm a priest what do you think is going to happen if the people driving by see you starting to beat on a priest with white hair? And number two, as I was coming up on the curb, I dialed 911. And the police are on their way. So do you really think it's wise to hit me? Well, he backed off. And the police arrived. Those are those moments like that when, when we really have an obligation as fellow humans to protect others that are, that are suffering. Once I was on the ferry from West Seattle to Vashon Island, we had only lived on the island for two months. And I saw four boys, teenagers, high school students, roughing up another boy. And they were pushing him, and they weren't letting him go. And I looked around, and everybody is sitting there minding their own business, reading the newspaper, looking out the window, doing everything to divert their attention to what was happening here. And there must have been 50 people that were in earshot of what was happening. And this wasn't a silent thing. These guys were, were shouting at him, pushing him, threatening him. And I went into my teacher mode. And I walked up, and I grabbed two of the kids by their, sh by their shirt sleeves, pushed them to the side, and I said, leave him alone. 
And one of them, in defiance, slugged this kid in the stomach right in front of me. And I took my hand onto his shoulder, forcibly sat him down on the floor, and I said, I'm not going to let you do this. And the ferry came into the dock, and they announced that we were on, that, that we are now on Vashon Island. And uh, and I said to this boy that they were attacking, I want you to leave now. And the rest of you are going to sit with me. And I looked at every all four boys, five, whatever there was, and I looked right them in the face. And I said, I want you to know that I'm remembering your face. So I will know who you are when I come to the high school to pick you out. <laughs> and the next day, I showed up at the high school. And I told the principal. And I described the boys. And she knew who they were. Oh, I know who they are. So she called them into her office, and they turned white, whiter than me. <laughs> now, I didn't have to do that. But I did as a Christian, as an Orthodox Christian. I had to do that. And there's so much in our world today that is so disturbing and so sad. I, you know, one of the police officers that was at this shooting recently. Uh, you know, we, 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 we hear nothing but all the bad stuff about police officers. This is a police officer who's getting people out of the building, uh, out of this building where all these shootings, this shooting has taken place. And he said, follow me, we're going to get out of here. And somebody was saying that he's shooting, and he says, I'll take the bullet for you. I don't know about you, but as an Orthodox Christian, I would rather take the bullet for somebody than live with myself for letting them be taken out. You don't have to be a police officer to do that. And most police officers would do that. I wrote a blog article once, maybe some of you have read it, where I, 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 I I suggested certain things that we could do to deepen our faith, and one of them was the next time you're pulled over by a police officer for speeding, apologize and thank him for stopping you and for helping you make your life safer by calling you on your stupid driving And tell him that you appreciate that he cares enough that he's writing you a ticket. I got pulled over. On the island where everybody knows me. <laughs> except this one deputy who was new, he didn't know me. He didn't know that he had pulled over a sheriff's chaplain who had made what they call, I'm sorry you people here in California, we call it a California stop. <laughs> in Washington, we call it a California stop. <laughs> so I came to a stop, it was late at night, no one was around, a four-way stop, I came kind of like this, looked both ways and went around the corner. Against the law, you have to stop completely. He pulled me over, and all these cars coming from the ferry are passing me, and they're all slowing down, and the spotlight is on me, and the lights, and there I am, the whitest guy on the island, lit up. Everybody sees Father Trefon, the chaplain, the abbot at the monastery has just been pulled over. 
And as he's walking, as I see him in the rearview mirror, I reach onto my dashboard and I pull away the sign that says police and fire chaplain. And I put it down between the seats. And I took my badge, which was on my belt, and I put it in my pocket. Because I didn't, because I knew that I didn't want him to think that their chaplain wanted special favors. So I didn't want him to know I was their chaplain. He found out because I went into a restaurant the following week, and whenever I see police officers, if they're having something I can afford, I always buy it for them. Because I get $400 a month Social Security. So I would be sort of not even be be able to afford to be a street person if I didn't live in the monastery, because I didn't put much into the Social Security system. But that Social Security money is the abbot's discretionary fund, which is where the money comes that I give away. And when I see, you know, like an old lady living, eating breakfast alone, or police officers eating, I will pay for it. So I was in there, and there was a bunch of police officers sitting over there. And, and I, when the waitress came over to give me my bill for my coffee, I said, would you add their coffee, whatever they're having onto my bill? And uh, Kurt, who's one of the deputies, he's been there for 33 years, uh, he sees me, and he knows what I do, and he called out, Father Trifon, why don't you let me buy you your coffee today? And uh, he says, there's, he says, and then he says to the others, he says, our chaplain is always buying us coffee. And one of the guys was the guy that had almost given me a ticket. He didn't. I think he took pity on me because he figured, like, oh, my God, this poor old guy. So he didn't give me a ticket. But I remember as I was driving off, I thanked him for stopping me and carrying me enough that he was doing his job. I'd like to get some kind of interaction going uh, about what you think about some of the things that I've said and if there are ideas that you've had or questions that you've had. First of all, I want to tell you that, that there are a number of, uh, of police officers in this room. And some of you probably already know that, but uh, I, I just want you guys to know that you have my love and admiration and my prayers. Uh, it's, a, it's a great job you do. And, you know, I, heard, I read an article recently, somebody ranting about how our police departments are militarizing and they're wearing, you know, military fatigues and have machine guns and, and, uh, uh, and these... Uh, these vehicles that look like they're in a war zone. And my first thought was, well, join the 21st century. We are in a war zone. And why should we expect our finest to go out and fight and, and, and do battle with these people that are armed to the teeth and in this couple that they had bulletproof vests on and, and fatigues themselves and we want our police officers to wear nice little blue hats and nice little blue shirts with badges on them. I don't want them to do that. I want them to live. I want to know that I won't have to go to their funeral. One of the funerals that I had to go to a number of years ago was when those four police officers were killed at the entrance to McCord Air Force Base. And they were in a coffee house. And they were just minding their own business. They had their laptops open. In this case, I don't care what kind it was. <laughs> but they had their laptops open and they were working, preparing for their day. A woman and three men. And this man came in, went up to a seemingly order a latte. And just as the barista said, what will you have? He, he 
whirled around and he shot them all and killed them. And uh, I always represent our department at funerals. It was the longest funeral procession at the time, they think, in the United States history. It started at McCord Air Force Base, and it went to the Tacoma Dome, and it took three and a half hours. And we were all told, go to the bathroom first. Anybody that pulls out can't get back in line. And I was the only person in my vehicle. And uh, every time, as we were leaving the base, and I saw these soldiers standing at attention, I just choked up. And I knew that if I started crying, that I wouldn't be able to see to drive, and then I'd have to pull off. And it was the most difficult three and a half hours I think I've ever had. It was like, just as you think you've got it under control, there's a flatbed with a bunch of, of old military guys standing on this flatbed truck with, with flags. Or you go by a school and there's a line with you know, 100 kids out with little flags standing there with their teacher like this. I mean, it was to see that love and respect of a, of a huge community. And the Tacoma Dome was, was close to the public. It was only uh, law enforcement officers that could go in it. And there were so many law enforcement officers that the parking was at a, at a, at a huge dif distance. And I was on a bus coming from where I had parked our department vehicle. You had to have a, a vehicle with, with lights and everything in order to be in this. And as we're, as we're on this bus, and I don't know anybody there. I didn't know any of the officers that I was with. I wasn't with anybody from our departments. And uh, so as we're going to this, to the Tacoma Dome, and I get off, and because the governor was there, and the Supreme Court justices, and the Superior Court justices and mayors and police officers from around the world were there, including over 500, I think it was, Royal Canadian Mounted Police in their red uniforms. And uh, so there were SWAT team all over, on the top of the dome, on top of hotels nearby, uh, at the entrance to parking lots, everywhere. And I was doing just fine until I got to the point where I was walking with some people that were plain clothes, suits, wearing suits, uh, police officers, didn't know them. And I am, I've got a, uh, a uh, Bluetooth, I'm talking to the head chaplain, um, who's kind of give, giving me, a, kind of debriefing me as I'm walking because I am by then spent. And uh, so I was just needing some support from another chaplain. And as I'm walking, um, I see this, this young SWAT team guy. And a lot of the SWAT team guys are uh, just out of the military, military police. And, and so they, uh, they tend to be the ones that are ready for doing that, and they know what to do. And so this guy's standing there, and he, he sees me, and kind of does this military about face, looks right at me, and not very happy. And I thought, you know, uh, any moment he's going to notice I have a badge. I, have, I was wearing my cassock, but I had a vest with a badge on it. On the back it says, chaplain. I thought, well, he's going to see this any minute. So he didn't. All he saw was this bearded man with his head covered, wired, disconnected with this environment. He calls it in. So it goes into security in the dome. So by the time I get around and I walk into the Tacoma Dome and I see a, a, sea, a sea of blue, of, of, red, uh, of the red coats of the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, and since I grew up in northern Idaho near the border, I really have an affinity for them. And I have some friends that are with the, with the Royal Canadian. So I went all the way around and went over there to thank them for being there. Little did I know that a takedown team had been prepared. <laughs> and you officers know what that means. You can be one of you young guys, and you're going to be medevaced after something like that. 
And I was supposed to meet up with my friend, Sheriff Pastor, who was uh, uh, with, from these guys, two of these guys were in his department before they went to this small uh, town. And uh, so I was going to meet up with him and, and, uh, and with a Superior Court Justice who's a parishioner. So, I get, so after I've talked to, the, to these guys, I went down on the main floor and the seats were all empty waiting for uh, the police officers from that department and the family members to sit down there. And so I walked up this aisle towards the four caskets and I was going to stand there and pray and bless the caskets and then go to Sheriff Pastor. So as I'm walking there, in God's divine providence, two weeks earlier, we had a, a police officer who's an undercover narcotics agent come to the monastery for liturgy on Sunday. He didn't identify himself as a police officer because he's undercover. And he looked undercover. You know, he looked, um, he had a beard and longish hair. And, and, uh, but he was on security. So he was one of them that immediately was responding and they were running. Uh, from behind me, ready to do this takedown. For those of you who don't know what that means, is you are thrown face first, spread eagle, pile on top of you so you can't detonate. And uh, as Sheriff Pastor told me when he found out about it, he said, well, Father, think about it. He said, if you had survived that, <laughs> you would have been worth $5 million and had a really, really technically late, or um, a, a state-of-the-art wheelchair. <laughs> Gee, boy. <laughs> and this guy that was the, uh, that worked uh, in undercover narcotics, as they were running for me, he was further back than the others, but he spotted me, and he knew who I was. And he called to the others, he said, Stop! He's a sheriff's chaplain. He's one of ours. And I didn't know anything about this until a month later when I, <laughs> when I heard about it. And uh, so, but, but I share that with you because, uh, like Father Wayne here, who is also a police chaplain, uh, our hearts are with them. It's not just something we do. It's something that we are. You know, we, had, we chaplains, when I first went through the Chaplain's Academy, and um, the, the, the best, the, the, the most notable Chaplain Academy in the entire nation is um, at uh, the um, Washington State Criminal Justice Center in Burien, where they train a lot of our police officers. And, uh, and they have this twice yearly week-long live-in chaplain's academy that you have to go through to be a uh, bona fide chaplain. And I went through that. And, uh, and so we had, at the beginning, we all took this sort of a personality test, and, and we found out that uh, we were all told that one of the uh, personality traits of chaplains is that we all have these first responder personalities. So like at the Boston bombing, you know, there were people that were running away from the bomb, and there were people running to the bomber spot, you know, to help. And those aren't necessarily officers or medics. They're people that have a, uh, a first responder personality. It's just it's what we do. But, but I have to tell you that one of the greatest perks of being a chaplain is you get to ride at high speed with the lights above you instead of behind you. <laughs> so I just share that as a little aside that, you know, your, your police officers and your FBI agents and all the others, the military. I was in New York, in Washington, D.C. a couple of years ago for the... Um, Orthodox, uh, International Orthodox Christian Charities uh, front, Frontliners, which is uh, a core of uh, Orthodox doctors, medics, 
um, clergy uh, who are, uh, we are the ones that are called out for some kind of a national or international emergency. And we had a meeting at the White House. We were in the, uh, the, the meetings were held in the uh, Indian, Indian Treaty Room of the Eisenhower Building. And I finally realized why we got away with breaking all the treaties with the natives is that the acoustics in that room were horrendous. <laughs> but while I was there um, is when the Boston bombing happened. We heard about it while we were there. And, uh, but there are there are innumerable numbers of our people, Orthodox people, that give themselves over to this kind of ministry and preparation for whatever might be coming down. And, uh, and, it's a, uh, and it's a calling. And I, and I share that with you because I'm sure that many of you here uh, would, be, would do well to be in, involve yourself in that calling, especially if you have medical training and uh, or just simply want to be of service to the community, the greater community. There's so many ways, again, incarnational, that we can be there. You know that a, uh, a chaplain is very much like the, um, the image that we have of the monks that came from Valam to Alaska. I was, uh, uh, I was in Seattle once and I I, I met this man, his name was uh, uh, Justin, pa Justin uh, Powell, Justin Powell. He was a native of, of the Tuolup tribe, and he was their spiritual leader. He was a Presbyterian, but, uh, but he had, uh, but in, in their own native religion, he also had sort of a, a dual shaman view uh, uh, of, with his community. And I asked him one day uh, to tell me about his native religion, and then he, he, st he started telling me a little bit about the shamanist beliefs. But then he said something very pointed. He said, but if I were a clinket or an Aleut from Alaska, you know my answer would be different, wouldn't it? And I said, yes, it would. And, and he said that because the way, the way they were evangelized was that they were, they were honored and respected. Their culture and their religion were respected. And they were told that they had to respect the native people and the native language and the native religion by the patriarch himself and the, and the czar. And they were told that, um, that when they went in there, that they were serving the spiritual needs of the Russian fur traders, but that as a missionary monks, their missionary efforts with the natives was one of loving them and honoring them. And so they didn't go in and knock down the, the totem poles like the the, like the uh, Protestant missionaries did after the sale of, of Alaska because they bothered to find out that these were teaching tools of their history. They didn't prevent them to do, of their, doing their native dances. They didn't, do, they didn't force them to speak English. They didn't force them to dress like, like uh, uh, people of, of Western society. They honored them. And he said because of that, if you ask a native in an orthodox village, what is your native religion? They will always say orthodox. Because their orthodoxy, they see, as having, is the fulfillment of their native religion. Not a replacement of some paganism, but the fulfillment of their native religion. And that is showing love and respect to, to communities that we want to share with. Anyway, so who has some thoughts or observations? 
Okay, so if you have any questions, please raise your hand. Since we're recording, we'd like you to speak into the microphone so we can capture that as a part of the recording. So. Could you give your name, as your, at least your first name? My name is Ruth, and I'm from St. Barnabas. Um, <clears throat> it seems to me that um, many of the stories that you've been telling us this morning, um, you're an extrovert, right? You, you um, are bold in, in meeting people, and... Um, for it's, I know that God makes each of us with different gifts and that some people are not inclined to be as bold, perhaps, but that they can still be a light um, of Christ to the world. And so I'm, and, and so I'm just wondering if you have um, thoughts about how some of us could identify with how we... Um, could apply this idea of incarnating Christ in ourselves um, in different ways. Um, the other thing I'm wondering about is uh, getting over fear, because um, I'm an extrovert myself, but I still find that fear is the thing that sometimes blocks me from doing good. Um, I may uh, try to protect myself rather than being bold in some way, that I need to be bold. How many people relate to that here? Okay. I think each one of us can start in a little way. So it doesn't mean that you have to boldly go where no man has gone before. <laughs> I love science fiction. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, oh, yeah, I can't do that. I've tried, but I, I have to go like this. <laughs> yeah, right. I was uh, the keynote speaker two years ago in Seattle for Doxicon. Do you know what that is? Yeah, you know? And, uh, and I, I am an extemporaneous speaker, and I thought, you know, some of these priests are going to give... And, and others that were lecturers, they were going to give these papers. And I'm not, that's not me. And I didn't know what to do. So I thought, well, I'll start by, I got it there early, and I took this big straw hat, and I put it in the podium, and I took this walking staff that I have, and I set that over there out of the way, and nobody could see it. And I was waiting down there, and Father James Bernstein, one of the local priests, was the sort of the master of ceremonies, and he got up and went up on this stage, which was about four feet from the floor, literally four feet. And uh, and uh, so he he gets up there and he says he introduces me. And before he introduced me, there was this big screen, and people from Doxicon in Washington D.C. were invite were in, were uh, in welcoming all of us. It was the first time that it had been on the West Coast. And so they, um, they welcomed me, and they, they, they gave me the title um, Tree Father. You know where that's from? Lord of the Rings. You know, the tree people. Wasn't it Tree Father, wasn't it? Or was it Tree Beard? Yeah, Tree Beard. Okay, so anyway, Father James gets up, and he says, for those who... Uh, don't know him. We're not sure whether Father Trifon was the, inv uh, the inspiration for Gandalf or whether Gandalf was the inspiration for Father Trifon. Well, he didn't know what I had in mind. So I got up, took my kamalafka off, reached down, and put on the big straw hat, which of course immediately everybody knew what I was about to do, and I took the staff I stood there with the staff and I said, You shall not pass. <laughs> and then it just kind of went downhill from there. <laughs> but 
So that is the extrovert. Uh, over the top, that's why the archbishop is embarrassed. Uh, that's why I'm still wearing this tattered old cross. I don't have the bejeweled cross. and Never will, you know. But you know, when it gets right down to it, as one of my friends said, you got to know, you got to go where you're celebrated. And, and what that really means, it doesn't mean relocating. It means being around people that inspire you and encourage you. And so sometimes the way to break our shyness is to, be, is to get involved. Like, for instance, a good way to, to get involved in that making the incarnation happen through us is being involved in a soup kitchen. And we don't have to have it orthodox. We can go to any soup kitchen, you know, uh, to um, Union Gospel Missions or someplace like that. Or we can get a group together and say, you know, we've got a big church kitchen. Let's do something about it. Let's make sandwiches and go out where the homeless are and give them out. We can do that. Or, go, go, you, here's another one that you can do. Go to a, a, an assisted living place where there are so many elderly people who are farmed out from their families who, because they are afraid of looking at their own mortality, don't go see them. I mean, you would be astounded to know how many people are stuck like that. And become their friend. And be Christ among them. Go, go into a, a rest home or care center. And just sit there and, and maybe hold their hand or, or talk about your grandchildren with them. Or let them talk about their grandchildren. Or their life. I remember once I was called in the middle of the night, an elderly woman living in a remote beach on Vashon Island, her husband had died. He dropped dead in the living room. And by the time the medics and the, and the sheriff's deputies arrived, he had been long dead. And the medical examiner doesn't come until the first ferry. And so this woman was going to have to be left alone with her husband's body until the first ferry. And so they called me. And I went down, and uh, the, the, her husband was lying on a sofa covered with a, a sheet. And the, uh, the others, they all had to leave. As soon as I arrived, the sheriff's deputies and the medics left. And I did what you could do, what anybody could do. I sat her in the, down in the kitchen, the kitchen table, and I opened a bottle of wine. And I poured the two of us a glass of wine. And then I held her hands and I said, My dear, tell me about your life with your husband. How many years were you married? They, were, they had been married 58 years. And I said, I want you to tell me about your husband. And about your life and your family and so we sat there over a glass of wine until the medical examiner arrived. And about a year later, I'm with my monks. We're having a little outing at the local pizza parlor. I hope this doesn't scandalize anybody. <laughs> and we're sitting there eating pizza, and I noticed this family sitting over at this other table. And this woman keeps looking at me, and I don't recognize her. But she keeps, every time I look up, she's looking at me. And finally, she comes over, and she says, you probably don't remember me, but when my husband died, you came and sat at my kitchen table and and poured me a glass of wine and let me talk about my husband. And I want you to know how much it helped. 
Now anybody can do that. And the key thing is, you know, one of the things that happens, and I, Vashon Island in the last year has gained the reputation in the state of Washington as having the largest uh, uh, per capita suicides in the whole state of Washington. And other chaplains, when they hear I'm from Vashon Island, will, will say that, what's going on on Vashon Island? And Vashon Island is a well-heeled community, well-educated, a new multi-billion dollar arts community center is coming up. We have our own opera company. We have our own chamber orchestra. We're only 11,000 people. 87% undeveloped forest. So everybody thinks we're living in an idyllic community. We have the largest concentration per capita of artists in the state of Washington. So everybody thinks everything's great. So why do we have a high suicide rate? Nobody knows. I know. I know why. Because our youth and the young adults have no, have, do not have Christ. They do not have God. They do not have religion. They're all follow followers of Sartre and Camus, and they don't even know it. They're nihilists. And in nihilism, there's no hope, and death is an escape. Is escape. So I have had to deal personally with more suicides of kids, of young people, in the last year than I could ever have imagined. And in most cases, I have become friends with their parents to help them through this. And a lot of people, when they lose someone in death, find themselves alone. Like old women whose husbands die and all of a sudden they're not included in these little card games where all the couples get together. Because nobody knows what to say. Oh, gee, you know, she's going to feel really outside because her husband's not here and we don't know what to say. We don't want to bring up the death of her husband because we'll just stir it up again. And I'm here to tell you, you're not stirring up anything that isn't there permanently. The best thing you can do in that incarnational moment with someone who's lost a loved one is just be there and listen. You don't have to talk. There is nothing you can say that's going to, no quotes even from scripture that you can read that's going to take away the pain of them having lost their loved one. It's not going to happen. That kind of pain only slowly ebbs away with time. But don't make them feel alone, like they have no one. Don't do that. Because at those moments, you are Christ in their midst. So you can be part of the community in your service to Christ by being available to people who have lost loved ones and family members. And realize you don't have to say anything. Thank you, Abbot Chief. Um, Stand up and say your name. My name is Christopher Rutledge. Um, I go here to St. Barnabas. Um, when I was listening to your talk, um, it helped me think about what I've been experiencing at school, um, trying to learn. Well, first of all, you talked about how we learn by gnomic by the heart, right? What, what did you call it? Was it the, the, the noose? The noose. The noose is that uh, when we were created, God implanted in us at the, at the moment of conception the noose, which is the eye of the soul. And it's that organ that allows us, that differentiates us from the soul of an animal and allows us to, have, oh, to be able to commune with God. Yes. Um, and... It reminded me of that because in, in my political science class, 
um, when we were starting out, uh, we were talking about law and its relationship to politics. And my teacher basically said, in this class you're not going to be looking for truth. You can go upstairs to the, politi to the um, philosophy department and do that there. This is, the only five, this is the only five minutes in class you're going to like, Christopher, because here we talk about natural law and what it does. And then after that, we're just going to talk about how politics is going to be related to law. And then she started presenting her beliefs on what she thought about law. Um, and it has a lot to do with, you know, tolerating other people. That's the, you know, the view she presented, you know. Everybody has a right to marry who they want to you know, all these different things. And it, it gets kind of confusing. It confuses me, and I, I would leave upset because I felt like I could not communicate what I wanted to communicate or really think about what, I, what we were working on. So how, how does, as a college student, how do, you, how do you find truth when it's not clear what the truth is, like it's just, there's so many different ideas, your teachers are telling you different things, you know, if, it, if it's hard to access the truth, how do you find it? When I was teaching in college, I remember different professors that in, in, uh, uh, relaxed times when maybe we're having a cocktail at a local bar and talking about our students that would actually share that they were bored teaching. Uh, I remember one professor uh, who taught in the classics department, he said, I am so bored with my students. And he says, it seems like every five years I might have one student who's brilliant enough that his contributions challenge me and I enjoy teaching. The rest of the time, it's just like going through the same old, same old. And then one of the other professors said, well, you can always play that academic game, which I had viewed, and that is destroying the belief system of your students. They're bored, so they want to play a game. And I wrote an article uh, last year, I think, addressing this subject about what, did you read that? You did? Okay. Anyway, this article. No, did anybody read my article? <laughs> <laughs> Enough of this. <laughs> but, but basically what I was saying in the article is that, that don't, for, for college students who are getting ready to go off to the university for the first time, know ahead of time that your professors are better debaters than you are. They're more skilled, they've been doing it longer. When I was a freshman, I had a professor, and, I, and, and it was uh, in, in a history class, I believe. And this professor asked all of us, how many of you believe that Satan is a real person, that Satan really exists? And I raised my hand. I was a good Missouri Synod Lutheran. Yay. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I was the only one that raised my hand. I was the president of the Lutheran Student Association. There were other Lutherans there. <laughs> they didn't raise their hands. And as soon as I raised my hand and I saw nobody else's hand was up, it was sort of like, how do you take that back? <laughs> oh, I was just scratching my head. Oh, there was a fly. And then, of course, the professor goes about trying to humiliate me, that I'm some sort of a medievalist who still believes in, in stupid things like that. Afterwards... I got together with a bunch of, the, of, my, of my friends from the Lutheran Student Union, that's what it was, Lutheran Student Union. I said, why didn't you raise your hand? I know you believe that, that the devil exists. Well, 
you know, I was afraid that it might affect my grade. That was one person. Or, oh, I didn't want to look stupid. Do you think being a Lutheran is stupid? Is that what you're saying? I mean, now I know that, but... (laughs) Are there any Lutherans here? Oh, one. No, that, see, that's what you, re- you recognize that being stupid to be a Lutheran, see? So you're, on the, you're okay. <laughs> so, you know, as a former debater, I can tell you that you don't have to be right to win a debate. You have to be a good debater to win a debate. And as long as you know that as a student... Don't enter into situations where you're going to be forced to try to defend your stand against someone that you know is a better debater. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to keep silent about your faith. What it means is don't be intimidated by people like that. And remember what I'm saying, they're bored. So they don't really want to destroy your belief system because they think they're right, but because they're bored. It's a challenge in a profession that has become boring to them. Now, let me go back to this professor. Within a year, he was Lutheran. And he told me one day, that I was the only student that he had any respect for. And he said, because I know that you were not the only one who believed that the devil really existed. He says, I I, I really figured that probably every student in the room, in the classroom, believed that, because most of them were churchgoers. But he said, you were the only one that boldly raised your hand. And he says, I respected that. And it made me want to know more about your belief system and what your church was like that would embolden you to to say, I believe that. And he and his wife ended up going to a Lutheran church. Not the same one I went to, but a Lutheran church. And then he called me off to the side one day and he said, because of you, I'm a Lutheran. So, you know, it's... It's sort of like when I was probably 21, I went, I joined Le Prinzi's gym in Portland, Oregon. It's a flat, do you know that one? You do, get, you get out of here. <laughs> How do you know it? I live in Portland. Okay. Well, I, when I got out of high school, out of college, you know, I, I, I was a runner, but I wanted to buff up for the, for the women. <laughs> I weighed 155 pounds, and I was six foot, and I thought, you know, I've got to buff up. <laughs> so I joined Le Prinzi's gym. Le Prinzi's gym at the time, I don't know about it now, it's still there, but Le Prinzi's gym was a classical weightlifting gym run by an Italian family. When you went in there, everybody that was working out there, they were all really into it. They were really nice people. So I walk in there, and skinny, and I'm looking. I don't even know where to begin. So I thought, well, I'll start here. So I bent down like this. I couldn't lift it. So this guy who was about 65 comes over barrel chested, big arms, and he says, son, would you like me to show you how to use this place? And I said, sure. So he showed me how to lift, what to lift, how to balance out the the weightlifting, uh, work lower body one day, upper body another day. If you're running, do your um, short runs, one day, longer runs, the next day when you're working on the upper body. He told me all of this stuff. The same day he offered to help me, 
There was another guy about my age who came in there who was skinny and was going to get buffed. And somebody else went up to him and said, can I help you, son? I don't need any help. So about two months later, these two guys who were just, uh, they were part of that place. They were always there, retired. And two of these two guys said, David, that was my name. Have you noticed this, uh, this, this fellow over here? Do you see anything weird about him? And I said, yeah, he kind of is leaning like a gorilla. And this guy said something very orthodox, actually. He said, well, that's because he's his own trainer. He's doing all of his exercises, weightlifting, looking in the mirror. So everything he's working on is here. But he's not working on his back. And so all the muscles, so as he was getting bigger here, there was a slight tilt. So when he would walk, it was kind of like... (laughs) And what kept him from that was pride. It's sort of like what we can say, if you are your own spiritual director, you have a a fool as a spiritual father or mother. You know, it's better to have other people who can look at us from a different angle and say, gee, you need to work out back here. Or the back of your legs need to be worked out. You need to do that. You need to work that out. And so, where was I going with that? Where were we? Okay, so, so, so my point is, number one, it's important that you young people are grounded in the faith. Now, when we started this Salish Brotherhood of, of St. John the Wonder Worker, the whole idea of that was that young men who are the ones that are going to have the most problems with people like that would have each other. I wanted to have a form something that would be long after I'm dead and gone. And so what's already happened is that we have each one of these guys, when they become a member of the Brotherhood, they're either on Facebook together or they have each other's email address and phone numbers. And so when one of the guys is struggling with an issue, maybe depression, or his girlfriend broke up with him, or all these kinds of things, he can call one of his brothers, or he can post it to everybody and say, gee, pray for me, I'm really struggling. And they do, they're praying. And then I look in amazement. I don't even have to say anything. I don't have to give any spiritual advice at all. I'm watching in amazement what these guys are doing for each other. And so when, when, when you go off to college and you've got that, you've got your, your, your mates backing you, uh, th- that's a huge empowerment. That's what the Orthodox Christian Fellowship is about. You know, most campuses have chapters of, of the Orthodox Christian Fellowship. It's for that purpose. It's not just a little social time to get together and eat ice cream. It's about being Orthodox together. It's about empowerment. It's about not thinking that, well, if you're religious, somehow you're deficient. You know, I I was so delighted to hear, for instance, that there are so many police officers in this parish. I mean, that, you know, that, that, and, and here's something else that we men need to remember. Only, this is proven statistically. Only the Orthodox Church has an equal number of men and women in our services normally. Only our church. I went to the funeral of an Episcopal priest friend of mine on Vashon Island a few years ago. Every person in that church was white and white-haired and female, including the minister. There were no young people, and there were no men. 
And there's even a book written about the subject, which is the feminization of Christianity. And the beautiful thing about our Orthodox faith, my friends, is that all of us, both men and women, have elements in the church that we need and that empower us. For men, there's a physicality to orthodoxy. It's demanding. It's, it, it's telling you that this faith is not for wimps. It's, it's we fast, we stand for long services, we have the domestic church in our home for our families so that the kids are seeing orthodoxy live not just on Sunday. We have our icon corners. We, we do prostrations. It's emboldening. And for women, because you are naturally inclined to have a strong intuition, Orthodoxy is a perfect fit because orthodoxy is a faith based on the intuitive knowledge of the heart, which is something we men need to learn. And women need to learn to be powerful. And the Orthodox Church enables you to learn how to be powerful. So you're standing with your men equally, as equals. You already outlast us in years. But, but, but you're equals. And, and so, and you know with people that say, oh, well, you know, the Orthodox Church doesn't allow females to be ordained. Well, but if you look at the churches that do allow females to be ordained, where are the men? They're out of there. It's not that they don't want a female over them. And it's that there's no place for them. They don't feel there's a place for them. And so uh, I, I was just talking to um, a man, a doctor, who was flying back from Pennsylvania. The Lord, in his great mercy, had a cardiologist sitting next to me. <laughs> and uh, I turned to him and I said, are you by chance a doctor? And he says, why do you ask? And I said, you look like a doctor. <laughs> and he says, well, as a matter of fact, I'm a cardiologist. And I said, where? University of Washington. And he says, are you from Vashon Island? And I said, yes. And he says, I work for a company with one of your parishioners, Gabriel, who told me all about you. He says, Gabriel is the one that invented this monitor that we use for the heart, a little tiny monitor. So we had this nice little dialogue. Uh, I flew here, the man sitting next to me. I said, are you an attorney? He said, no, I'm an economist. And I said, I hear an accent. He's from Germany. So I had a nice chat with this German Catholic from Germany who's an economist. I asked him for advice. <laughs> what can I do with my $400 a month? <laughs> he said, sit on it. <laughs> but but when, in our monastery, is a good example. On any given Sunday, which is the day we usually have visitors that come for liturgy, there are more men in our church than there are women. Where else are you going to find that but in orthodoxy? Which makes this, for you unmarried women, great hunting grounds. <laughs> you don't have to hang out at the neighborhood tavern to try and find a good man. Go to church. It's full of them. And for you men, this is the place where you're being tweaked and changed to be the good fathers and the good example you're going to be, which I've seen so many of you today. I'm impressed with what I have seen with the number of you men who are being tender with your children. St. Seraphim of Seraph, and when I was first elevated to the rank of abbot, my friend Bishop George emailed me a quote from St. Seraphim of Sarov. It was a directive to abbots. He said an abbot must be both father and mother to his children. 
And one of our young monks, when time complained to me, says, Father, you're just not strict enough with me. And I, you know, you don't give me these, these uh, penances and all these things. And I said, I give you what you need. You need a mother. You already had that from your biological father. And look where you are. You need a mother now. So I'm going to be your mother. I could be a circus mother. (laughs) (laughs) With my own tent. (laughs) Yes. Thank you, Abbot Trifon. I'm Mary. I'm from um, St. Paul American Coptic Orthodox Church in Tustin. Yay, Yay, Cops! cops. (laughs) Shout out. (laughs) Um, (laughs) uh, I wanted to ask you, it's actually kind of a serious question, so I'm kind of sorry I started that way, but um, why is it so much, so much harder, and this is definitely true for me, uh, to be an agent of God's mercy, of God's grace, to people outside my home than it is to be that to my husband and my children. It's a struggle for me at home, whereas outside of home, it's less of one, and I want to know why. Why is it more difficult? Because it's salvific. If it was easy, it wouldn't be salvific. You know, if, if, if life, you know, when I look at my own life in the most difficult times that I have had, in loss, for instance, personal lo- loss that I've had, tragic things in my life, at the time, I wished that I could have avoided them, that they never happened, but in hindsight, I look back at those events in my life and the loss that I have had personally as probably the most salvific moments of my life. I was working with a young man who recovered from an attempted suicide on Vashon Island. He hung himself, and by total divine providence, his girlfriend, who was working, had left work early because she wasn't feeling well. And by the time she got into their home, he was black. And she had a a difficult time untying the noose. And she gave him, she called the medics, and then she was giving him, um, trying to revive him. And when they got him to the hospital, they didn't think he was, they they medevaced him off the island, and they didn't think he was going to live. And I got a call. I knew him because he was a guy that we hire to cut trees for us. So I knew him personally. And, uh, and so I was told that uh, he was not expected to live and that if he did live, he wasn't going to have any brain left because he, he was without oxygen for too long. So I went over to Harborview and I took the myrrh, of the, which I always carry with me from the, from the Iveron icon of Hawaii, the myrrh streamer, and I went into the room. I wore my badge because I can go beyond where most clergy have never thought of going. It emboldens me. And so there were a bunch of doctors and nurses standing around in his room, and and I didn't stop and say, could I come in? I have a badge. They don't have a badge. I have a badge. (laughs) So I just walked right in, and I went right up to his bed. And I spoke his name. And I, and I said, I'm going to anoint you for healing. And I made the sign of the cross over his forehead. And then I stepped out of the room. Miraculously, he not only recovered, but he hadn't lost any functions, brain functions, at all. The doctors were amazed. So, you know, it's believe. You know, periodically we hear people say, oh, you know, I, Father, I don't really know whether I believe any of this stuff. There's one guy told me once, he says, Father, I, I don't know. Is there anything to this orthodox stuff? 
Is there anything to it? I'm not sure I believe anymore. And I said, Peter, if you'd put half as much energy into your faith as you do into your entertainment, you'd be a strong believer. It takes work, like anything good, like, like lifting weights. You don't just go join a gym and now I'm, I'm, I'm going to be buff, I joined a gym. Well, big deal. You joined a gym. Do you know that gym, the, these gyms make a huge amount of money by people who pay big money to join the gym and never go? They maybe go twice, and then they don't go anymore, and they've already paid. We need to work on our faith. And we need to make our faith the most important thing of our week. If you're not praying the morning and evening prayers every day, you're not working at it. If the only time you get religion is on Sunday, you don't have it. Clear is easy, simple as that. If you're sitting there about to eat a hamburger with friends at, on your lunch hour and you don't make the sign of the cross, you don't have to make a big, you don't have to stand up. And, In the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. You don't need to do that. In fact, it's better you not. But you got your hamburger there and you're an Orthodox Christian and you just quickly, for just a moment, you, you lower your head and you just make the sign of the no big thing. But you've made the sign of the cross. And I can tell you that even the ones that may scoff at it or think, oh, Lord, he's religious, are deep down wanting it. This is what I tell college students. And I know it from personal experience. I see it. When I go to campuses and I, and I enlighten young people about orthodoxy, and they see Christianity for the first time. They thought they knew Christianity and they rejected it. And then they hear what we teach and they want it. And often it's because they see a student that lives it. And he's made the sign of the cross. When I was getting on the airport, you know, getting, uh, about to board my airplane, the pilot comes up and, and he looks at me and he says, are you Orthodox? And I said, yes. So am I. Good. <laughs> <laughs> so when I sat down, this German economist sitting next to me, I said, you need to know something. You're not only sitting next to an Orthodox priest, but the pilot is Orthodox. You're in good hands. <laughs> and he looked and he smiled and he says, wow. He says, I've never had that happen with a Catholic priest. I'm Catholic. I'm a German Catholic. And then he said, something about you Orthodox. He says, I've noticed in Germany that the Orthodox churches in Germany are, are, are filled with young people and young men. And our Catholic churches in Germany are devoid of young people, certainly no young men. Why is that? And then I shared a little of why that was, just as I've shared with you. So we never know what doors are opening and what we can do to nurture other people in the faith and to go deeper. And, and I have to tell you, would, would you come up here for a moment? You, yes, I, I need a teaching tool. <laughs> right up here. Ta-da! <laughs> this is orthodoxy. I mean, look. Two generations of orthodoxy right here. 
And we have a father that is obviously a loving, caring man who has been standing back there inspiring this old monk with his tender care of his son, who could be a bishop someday. (laughs) If I lived long enough, he could be my bishop. And he may remember this moment. (laughs) What's your name? Peter. Peter. Peter the Apostle. Thank you. Yes. Oh. Abbot Trifon, I'm Deacon Thomas Braun. I'm a member of this parish here. And Lucky uh, you. Yes, yes. Well, we're blessed to have Father Wayne as our parish priest. So, um, What advice can you give us as we interact with the gay community and we're pushed with tolerance and being politically correct, but also not wanting to hedge on speaking the truth and addressing sin as sin. Um, I was thinking Christopher uh, Rutledge asked the question as a college student, and I can only imagine when, when I was in college 30 years ago, it, it was not even an issue, and I, I've got to believe it's just a huge issue on campus and huge pressure to be accepting and tolerant. So, and, and so that's part of the question. And also, there's these issues happening where maybe professionals like photographers, cake bakers, etc., are being sometimes even prosecuted for declining politely to serve a, at, a, at a gay wedding. What, what advice can you give us, and how should we respond as Orthodox Christians? This is really one of the great uh, issues of our time, and it's one that, uh, that if we don't handle it properly and carefully, we are going to use we are going to lose our younger generation. Because our younger generation, the good part of this is that they are, they are, this is a generation that has had it to hear with bullying. And they want to put an end to it. And their friends, you know, it's not like gay people all of a sudden exist for the first time. When I was young, back in, in the 1840s, as I said earlier. Every, I didn't know any gay people. There was one professor that loved roses that we kind of suspected. <laughs> but he was also a boxer, so we weren't sure. <laughs> I know a priest the same priest that I told you that threw this guy out and took away his scholarship, whose brother-in-law is gay. And the brother-in-law is forbidden to come into their home. That makes me sick to hear that. Makes me sick. We can uphold the teachings of the church in all of its strictness and biblical basis without losing love and mercy. I have a cousin that just came to visit the monastery a couple days ago, about three days ago, from, from Spokane. Her dad, second cousin, her dad is my, my youngest ne- uh, 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 cousin. And her dad is now showing signs of the same dementia that his dad, that their dad, the grandfather and father, suffered for 10 years not knowing who he was. So Finn is very worried about his dad. And I'm the only relative that Finn feels he can talk to. Finn, when I first knew Finn, was Cynthia. A beautiful young girl. Finn is now post-operative, male identity, identified, transgender. I am the only relative in our entire extended family that has shown love to Finn. That doesn't mean I understand. It doesn't mean I agree. But I love. 
when I was at Evergreen State College and I had finished that time and I at the very end I told the students that I used to come to these uh, psychology uh, workshops at this campus in the summertime would be here for a, a week a whole bunch of psychologists and and, uh, and I said I would treasure it if some of you would have pity on an old monk who doesn't have many years left if you would accompany me to the student union so the professor that had invited me I think I told you this earlier did I not okay I told somebody else this weekend I told you so uh, this professor said, uh, the one that had invited me, that was part of this plot, stood up and he said, any of you who has my class the next period, I will cancel it and you can accompany me with Abbot Trifon to the student union if you'd like. So 20 some students are walking with us to the student union. And in transit to the student union, there were three students that came up to me and said privately as we were walking, could I have a little time with you? And I said, sure. So we were there for two and a half hours at least. One of those students, after my talk with the rest of them, we, I went aside and I wasn't sure about her gender because she was dressed like a boy, but kind of like a girl, but I wasn't sure. And she said, I am transgender, going from female to male. And I, in, in my whole entire life, I have never been loved. No one has ever loved me. And I said, well, I love you. And I hugged her. When we moved to Vashon Island some back in 88, I got a telephone call about a year later from a priest in uh, New York City. Oh, they're tree fawn. I now know why you moved your monastery to Vashon Island. I just read an article in the New York Times. Vashon Island has the largest concentration of lesbian couples in the state of Washington. <laughs> oh, I said, Father, you discovered my secret. <laughs> and then we had this picnic, an annual picnic at the monastery, because we wanted our neighbors to get to know who we were, because we heard a rumor going around that, that, that there, there were these saffron-wearing, robe-wearing robe monks who didn't speak. Well, number one, we weren't wearing saffron robes, and we do speak a lot. <laughs> and so I thought, well, we need to let our neighbors know who we are. And this is before we started building. We just had this big you know, we just cleared the, the forest for our property where we're going to build. And so we decided that we were going to uh, put up posters, flyers around our immediate community, inviting people to come to the monastery with lawn chairs, blankets, food to share, and whatever uh, booze you wanted to, to bring. Because we're orthodox. <laughs> We had about 75 people show up. And we had all these people sitting around. We had all these picnic tables that we set up. People brought all of this food, and everybody was celebrating. And, and uh, Father Paul says to me, have you noticed how many lesbians we have here? <laughs> and I said, yes, I have, actually. And we figured just from some of the people that had lived in the neighborhood that were, that had already gotten to know us, there were five lesbian couples of the, of the 70 some people, five lesbian couples and three gay male couples that lived in the vicinity of our part of the island that were there. What to do? 
love. Love, not judge. I've got enough to answer for before the throne of God without adding that I was a judgmental person. The only way that once when we had an open house at the monastery and we published it around the island and people could come and have a tour of the monastery and I was in the church the other monks were out giving the tours and I was in the church talking about the monastery and there was a among the people that were in the church at one point was a, were a couple of young men who were probably in their mid-twenties and as they're standing there next to each other I just saw kind of a fleeting moment when their hands touched. And, and then they dropped. But, but just for that fleeting moment. Was, and I think they thought, and it wasn't like they were doing it in my face. It was just this natural, what they do. They're, they're, they love each other. They're touching each other's hands. They're holding each other's hands for a moment. And then they, they stop. As they were leaving, one of them said, are your services open to the public? And I said, yes, we would, be, we would love to have you. Now, they never did come. But the point being, the only time it's my business, what they do in bed, is when they show that they're interested in orthodoxy. Because as an orthodox priest, it's my responsibility to help you in your journey to God and to go deeper into the faith and to help you in every way that I can to do that. It's not my, you know, so back to the young man, uh, you know, who's kicked off the parish council and, and banned from communion. I have no doubt that it, he wanted to go to seminary. He was planning after he graduated from Pacific Lutheran University the following year, he was going to go to Holy Cross Seminary. He would have made a great priest. His priest said that. And now he's not even orthodox. So, you know, it's not about how well if he had gone, then he would have, you know, as one deacon at one of our orth Washington Orthodox Clergy Association meetings when this subject came up, one of the deacons, stupidly, in my opinion, said, well, it's like a cancer. We, not, we have to rid the parish of a cancer. What? A person is cancer? I don't think so. So what we do is we don't judge people. And we help them on their journey. And we love them equally. I have a very close relationship with the Ethiopian community of, of San Francisco, of Seattle, as well as the Coptic community. Whenever the Coptic priests come to the monastery with their people, they always bring wonderful Coptic food. <laughs> I love Coptic food. And uh, I certainly don't like Norwegian food, let me tell you. Sorry. <laughs> and, uh, but I have a very close relationship with the Ethiopian community because my last year as a chaplain at Twin Rivers Correctional, there was a young Ethiopian man uh, by the name of Schumet, who had been a, in the prison for seven years of the eight years I was serving there. And he was about to be released, and he was going to be deported back to Ethiopia. So he was going to be going to a federal retaining prison in, in, in the Seattle area, and then sent back to Ethiopia. And I'm having some time with him. And Schumann told me that I was the only father that he had ever known, that his own father died when he was an infant. And he said, we have a tradition in Ethiopia that if, if you say, you are my son, and I say, you are my father, it's a real done deal. This is, a, this is an adoption. And I said, Schumann, would you like me to be your father? And he said, yes. And I said, Schumann, you are my son. And he said, you are my father. And we hugged. And then I thought, oh my gosh, he's being deported. I'm his father. 
I gotta help him with money. I don't have any money. <laughs> you gotta think ahead of time before you say things. So I called his brother in law and I said, Guess what? I'm an Ethiopian. <laughs> really? I said, Yes. And I told him, He said, Yes, you are. In our tradition, in our culture, if, if, if you have adopted one of ours, you are one of us. You are an Ethiopian. And I said, help me out. I need to raise money for my son. He's being deported. He said, could you ask Archbishop Lucas, or uh, Archbishop Marcus, he's dead now, Archbishop Marcos, if, if I could be blessed to come to the Ethiopian cathedral and raise money for my son? And he said, yes. So, that was probably 10 years ago. So I was dropped off at the ferry, walked onto the ferry. His brother-in-law picked me up at the other side. And, um, and he drove me to the Ethiopian cathedral. He dropped me off at the parking lot. And there's an empty parking lot, no cars, nobody there. I walk into the cathedral. There's a priest there. He says, oh, wait here in this room off the narthex. I will be back for you in about 20 minutes. And I'm th thinking, there's nobody here. How am I going to raise money? So, about 20 minutes later, the same priest, who's now Archbishop Lucas, comes back. And he is fully vested. He says, come with me. And I go out the front door. There's a thousand Ethiopians out there. They were pretty quiet. <laughs> If this had been Russians, you would have heard him coming. <laughs> and in the middle of this plaza, this parking lot, is a big cross with fern, with palms lashed to it. It's the Feast of the Exaltation of the Cross, and they're on the, own, it's the same feast it's calendar as we are, so they are, that was our liturgy that morning for the Feast of the Exaltation, and it's theirs, and they're having a special celebration in the afternoon. And, uh, and at the far end, facing that cross, are two white watered silk thrones with, made up with black ebony framing. Beautiful. Big. And sitting in one of them is Archbishop Marcos. And there's a young man standing behind him with this giant Ethiopian umbrella. And he, the young man is wearing this white watered silk robe. And I just like, whoa. And, and I'm taken up by this priest to Archbishop Marcos. And I bowed before him, and he extended the blessing cross, and I kissed it. He tapped me on the forehead, and I kissed it again. And then he goes like this. And this priest escorts me to the identical throne. And all of a sudden, the shadow of one of these big umbrellas is over me. Nobody's going to believe this. <laughs> I don't have a photographer. I don't even have the ability to take a selfie. <laughs> and so, I'm sitting there, beholding this incredible ceremony that went on for hours. And... Uh, and then the archbishop stood up, and they have this tradition where the choir does this sort of a slow liturgical dance. So you have two rows of young men and women on this side, two rows facing them over here. And one will have a staff, one will have a small umbrella, and the other one will have this percussion instrument that is um, made out of brass, shaped like this with a wooden handle, and there's a wire in between, and it has these, uh, these little um, coins. So if you go like this with it, you make this percussion sound. So the, 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 three, the, the two rows on this side would take three steps forward, and the ones would on the other side would take three steps backward. Forward, backward, forward, backward while chanting the songs. It was absolutely beautiful. And they did this for about an hour, changing some of the melodies. It was beautiful. 
And then we all stood up and we went to the center cross and the archbishop blessed it with holy water. And then there was this, you know, you all smelled frankincense, which, is, which comes from the Ethiopians, pure frankincense. They don't use a little bit like we do, you know, like a, here's a little sensor, let's put a little in there. They have this big bat like this, like the Old Testament. And they pour huge quantities in there. So there's a huge cloud of incense wafting up into the air. I was surprised the fire trucks didn't come. And, and then we started going around as he was blessing all the four sides of this cross. And then we went back and sat down in our thrones. And then all, then they brought the drums out. I wish we had drums. And so then these young men with these drums and a few young women. And they go around and around. And some women had, or some men and women had umbrellas. And some of them had these walking sticks. And they're going around with the children and everybody, around and around and around, uh, with a celebratory dance like King David. It was so beautiful. And then as things settled down, the archbishop stood up, and he was handed a microphone, and he gave a speech. And then with the microphone, he, he kind of went up. I found out later that he was telling everyone that Abbot Trifon had ministered to one of theirs when they didn't and was a father to one of theirs who was in prison when they didn't. And of course, when you're coming from a country like Ethiopia where you've had trouble with the military and with prisons, you're afraid to go. So I never judged them. There was a reason why they were afraid to go to a prison. So in those seven years, I was the only priest that ever visited with the their, with their son of their parish. And then they handed me the microphone. And I started off by saying, I told them a little story about Schumann and how I came to, become, to be his, his father. And I concluded by saying, I am an Ethiopian. And they all did that little trill, the women. Oh, I love that. I wish we had that too. <laughs> That's why we have to all get together, so we can share all these things. And, and they did that. It was, it was just, oh my gosh, it was just beautiful. And then people turned their umbrellas upside down and passed around. And I raised over $5,000 from these poor people. And I sent my son off. He married a beautiful woman. And on my desk in my office, I have a picture of my granddaughters. If I ever go to Ethiopia, they're going to think Grandpa just stepped out of a tomb. <laughs> so that's it. Okay, five minutes. Uh, what advice do you have for someone, uh, me in this instance, who is a convert, but I'm the only Orthodox person in my family? Uh, do you have any uh, any How comments or suggestions? How do we witness our Orthodoxy when we're the only member of our family? You know what I did with my parents? I went off to college as an undergraduate with the intention, I went to Concordia College in Portland. I was going to be a Missouri Synod Lutheran minister. I had horn-rimmed glasses, hair parted down the side, wearing sport coats and, and collegiate sweaters and ties. And my mother was so proud, my son was going to be a Lutheran minister. And then the 60s hit. <laughs> And I switched colleges, and I embraced counterculture. And I grew my hair long and my beard long, and I wore beads, and I smelled the patchouli oil. <laughs> and I smoked something mysterious. <laughs> and I went home for Christmas. 
in my Volkswagen bus with flowers and peace signs <laughs> painted on the side. I have a little replica of it in my office, as you've seen, Connor. And so here I am. Years later, I, be, I go to graduate school. I become a nice, you know, wearing tweed jackets, ties, short hair, trimmed beard. My mother's proud. And then I met orthodoxy. All of a sudden, I'm smelling of incense. My hair is long. My beard is long. I'm dressing funny. I have things around my neck. And my mother's embarrassed to be seen with me. So she will no longer accept dinner invitations. My parents, oh, let me cook for you. And she didn't even want to hear about orthodoxy, because orthodoxy was destroying her son. I was going back to being a hippie in her mind. And you know what I did? I prayed that the Lord would help me be the very best son that I could be to my parents. And I, started, I became more sensitive to them. I called them regularly throughout the week, just little short calls. How are you doing, Mom? How are you doing, Dad? And as I did that, and I, and I, I, I gave, once I, I got a big box like this, and I wrapped little gifts, gift-wrapped boxes inside of Christmas gifts that I knew my parents wouldn't buy for themselves, gourmet items and whatever. I filled a box with this stuff, and I gave it to a priest that lived in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And I said, would you deliver this to my parents and would you tell them that they are to open the box and take all the gifts and put them under the tree and then hug them for me. And my mother called me and she said, Father Gregory came by and he gave us the box and he hugged us and I've never been hugged by a Lutheran minister. And it was the beginning of their being orthodox. So when they see how you change, that how orthodoxy changes you, and then at the same time you're praying for them. So you're praying that God will help you be the very best family member that you can be and give the very best example of what it means to be orthodox. And they will see, and this will be sort of like a taste and see, and they will want what you have. And this goes double for you young people in college with your friends. If they see in you what they don't have, they will want it. But they will only see it if they hear from you. It goes for, for you police officers. It goes for you nurses. It goes for everybody here. Pray that you be the very best person you can be. Glory to thee, O Christ our God. Glory.